so excited about what's to come here in the next 45, 50 minutes. But we are in a kind of our soft launch today of what we call Kingdom Builders at Saints Community Church. How many of you that are regular attenders here at Saints Community Church love what God does through our generosity, through Kingdom Builders? And Kingdom Builders, if you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, dude. What, what in the world uh, does that mean? I want to give you just really quickly the definition of Kingdom Builders for Saints Community Church. Kingdom Builders is an opportunity to excel in generosity by giving over and above the tithe to sponsor global missions projects, local projects to better our community, and future expansion projects for our locations to reach more people. In other words, God, I'm surrendering the tithe to you. I'm giving back that 10%, and this is what you've asked me to do biblically, to surrender my finances and to remember that you are in charge of my finances. And as Libby already said this morning, to, to remember that you gave me the power to have that job, and you, you gave me the breath that I needed to go to work, and you provided for me. That is, the tithe is me surrendering. Uh, but I, I believe that tithing is obedience, and what we do through kingdom builders is generosity. And so generosity starts when we go over and above the tithe, and we say, I care about what's happening around the world. I want to help sponsor global projects that are reaching people and building water wells and rescuing people from tough situations, hopeless situations. And then we have the opportunity to also say, hey, I care about my city. I care about helping the New Orleans mission reach the homeless and the addicted uh, in our city. I care about Crossroads NOLA helping uh, to help misplaced foster children to have a place to connect them with other families. All of these different nonprofits that we get to partner with through Kingdom Builders. And God, I also care about our locations, our Metairie location, our Belt Chase location, our future locations. I care about our locations being able to reach more people. And this year, I, I'm not going to give you all of the different projects. That will happen next week. Don't miss next week. We're going to pass out a little booklet with all of the different projects that we're doing. But I do want to say two things. Number one, I want to give you the goal that we have as a church in both of our locations this year I'm believing God, and I pray that you are too, for $125,000 that we can give. Come on, do you believe that we can do this together this year? I'm not convinced. Go ahead, clap a little louder and help me have faith. Come on. I'm believing this year that as we give generously, that God's going to help us to go far and above that goal of $125,000. Dollars. And this morning, we have something very special happening. I have a friend here this morning. Some of you are all like, I didn't know you had uh, any of those. Uh, but I have a friend here this morning that I go, at this point, way back with. In fact, I met him on my very first day of Bible college at North Central University in Minneapolis, Minnesota, because he was my RA. If you don't know what that means, that's resident advisor. And really what that means is he was in charge of me uh, for those years that I was in the dormitory at North Central. So this guy has all kinds of stories on me that I'm begging that he doesn't share any of uh, this morning of me in college. But more importantly, I just want to say that God reconnected Paul and I. We've been friends a long time, but he reconnected Paul and I just a few months ago at a little banquet thing that we were sitting next to each other at. And I remembered how honest, how authentic, and how much Paul and Candace and their entire family lives out their faith on a daily basis. Our hearts are connected. Our spirits are connected. And Paul is the director of one of our biggest kingdom builders partners that we have this year of a nonprofit called Venture. So here's what I'm going to ask. As he comes up to speak for us this morning, I'm going to ask that this be a place that he wants to come back to. And so here's what that looks like. If the jokes are funny, laugh. If the jokes aren't funny, still fake laugh. Okay? As God gives him the words to speak to us this morning, 
I want you to amen. I want you to take notes. I want this to be in a fun place for him uh, to preach. He'll be back at our Bell Chase location uh, this summer, but I am super excited to introduce to you my friend and the director of Venture Nonprofit Ministries. Paul, would you come up and, oh, I am super excited to introduce the video of Venture, and then Paul will come up. Watch this video. What would I do to rescue her? I would do anything. They have a right to have a good life. They have a right to live as a human. There are poverty issues, the lack of education and the belief system. All these things are uh, contributing factors for the girls to be trafficked. There will be a lot of challenges for my people. But if I believe gospel is good news, then we need to bring this good news on time. We need to find a way that how to save the children, how to keep more children in our children's home. We are helping, even though we may be in danger too, but we take this risk. Brothel will sundown. Untouchable people will rise in the nation because of the gospel. So I was standing on top of the tallest freestanding mountain in the world when I had a moment. One of those moments that kind of changed your life. If you've ever had one of those, you look back on it, you may not have known it at that moment, but as you look back, you know that changed not only the, the trajectory of my life, but also my family's life. And there's actually a dotted line that goes from that mountaintop right here to this moment in the conversation that we're having. But before I tell you about that moment, how about I just say it's great to be here? Uh, really, seriously. Um, I, I got like goosebumps when I pulled up because you all might not know this, but I've been following this church for a long time. And as Wayne said, uh, well past um, before even this church, our friendship with Wayne and, and Christy. And yes, Wayne did roll in as a freshman in way too big and baggy of pants and way too scruffy of hair, but I'm not going to I'm not going to talk all about that, all right? We, uh, we played soccer together, and while, yes, Lincoln's probably already a better soccer player than both of us put together, we were those guys, if you ever were on a sports team where there was a couple of really good guys, and then you try to hide all of the other people on the outskirts, that was, that was your dad and I. <laughs> and no matter how good of a coach he is, he wasn't, well. Uh, but here's what I will say. Wayne rolled in in those big old baggy jeans and that big old scruffy hair and loved Jesus with a passion that was intoxicating. And it's never gone. And unfortunately, some of our classmates it has, but has never gone. And yeah, I was his RA, but the Lord gave me a task and it was too great for me, so he sent Christy to clean up what I could not do. 
he knew Wayne needed like a super Christian, so picked a MK. And um, Christy uh, is not only a gifted musician, she's an anointed songwriter. And one of her songs uh, has gotten me through some of the most difficult places in my life. And so I'm so grateful for that. And then we, and then we fast forward and uh, we got to be at the same church together for a while in Texas. And that's where we um, started our families um, both of them having grown. Now, uh, my family has five kids now, and you can, you can see them. Uh, most of them are good looking. I'll let you decide uh, which ones are. I tell my oldest boy that he's one beard away from being good looking. Um, uh, but I am, I'm so deeply, deeply grateful for the Northrop family. I am probably most grateful for their love for this city. Uh, I had, until I met them, never met anybody that felt called to an actual city. Um, and man, my wife was introduced to New Orleans, um, and I know I'm saying it wrong, but I'm not going to try to be local because, you know, that won't work. Um, but you all introduced us to this city, and, but you introduced us to what it was like to love a city, and it's been deeply meaningful, and we carry that with us in our love. Uh, I live in Minneapolis, uh, specifically over north, if any of you know about that. Uh, but our city was the center of global attention a couple of years ago, and how we chose to step into it and step forward and with our city is due large part um, because of you and your family. And so when I say that it's an honor to be here, uh, I mean, it. I feel, man, I just have goosebumps. I'm so honored. And if you don't know it, if you've been here a long time or, or if this is your first time, this place is special. Like, y'all look good. And I don't mean physically good because some of y'all, you know, you need some work. But in terms of the, the whole, the whole, you look like the kingdom to me. Or at least you look like what I hope the kingdom looks like. And when I read the book, what I think it looks like. Uh, it's also an honor to be here on this Kingdom Builder emphasis, because for me, Kingdom Builder is like a portal. It is, um, Kingdom Builders isn't just what we do to give money to other people and help them over there, but Kingdom Builders is something that happens inside of us. It's an invitation for us to step into what God is already doing and has already been doing. One of the things that I loved already about this morning is we did communion, and then we did the Apostles' Creed, and these are moments where we partner with the global church, we partner with the historic church, we step into something bigger than just us or just saints' community. And Kingdom Builders presents that kind of an opportunity because God and his design and his kingdom is inviting us into something that is not only bigger than us, but is big inside of us and changes us and moves us. And so some of us, sometimes we, we're in a church service and we start listening, we go, oh, that's for them. Oh, this guy's good, that's for them, that's gonna be for them, but what if it's for all of us? What if it's not me to you, but God to us? and what he wants to say in this moment. And so I'm deeply, deeply grateful for Kingdom Builders. I'm grateful for what you do in the city. I'm grateful for your investment in the globe and in the future and the vision, the vision that you all have that never goes fast enough, never goes fast enough. But if we stick with it, we will see the promise is his kingdom come. So venture, we serve in the tough places. And here's what we mean by tough places. It's the intersection of unsafe, unreached, and under-resourced. And unsafe is refugee crisis, human trafficking, extreme poverty, but those things can be like bumper stickers, just big phrases that you see on Facebook and you click like, you know, you see some impoverished kid, you click like, you see this, click like. But let me just tell you, the refugee crisis where we serve, it's the longest ongoing civil war on the planet where the military and the government is committing ethnic genocide, creating historic refugee crisis where I will get emails on a weekly basis and there will be piles of body and that will be as PG-13 as I will make it. But there is real evil that need the kingdom of God to explode onto what is happening. And there are places in the world where we serve where up to 90% of the girls are being trafficked. And that too becomes this bumper sticker that we don't fully understand what it means. We just know it's bad, but I will tell you what it means. It means that when the girls that we serve are sold at 8, 9, 10, and 11, when that happens, they're abused 20 and 30 times every single day, after day after day. 
And so when we say tough places, we mean it, one of the countries that we serve in, it's illegal to meet in groups of more than nine people because the government wants to sequester everything and control everything, control thought, control the movements of God that are happening. In these dangerous places last year, we had four people that were killed simply for sharing the gospel. Real life martyrs. And it's these unsafe places that we also intersect with unreached, and unreached simply means less than 2% gospel witness. Out of every 100 people, less than two people know that there is a good God with a good design. And that design is for all of us to flourish, whether we're in New Orleans, North Minneapolis, or Nepal, that this design is for everybody. And when they hear that, they, you, you, can't, you can't understand how beautiful this story is, that there is a God that created them, that they are not the bottom, but they, they are the head. And then with unsafe and unreached, we also target under-resourced in the areas where we serve. With all of that injustice happening, we serve in places where less than 1% of all Christian giving goes. So out of every $100 that Libby raise, or makes coaching, less than a buck goes to help these unjust areas. And yet our partners are so passionate and we partner with local leaders because we are not the heroes. You have to understand that God is moving all around the world. And even though what I just painted sounds so lacking in hope, God is moving and we partner with local leaders who were born and raised in those areas who understand the complexity and who God is downloading his kingdom come in his design. And so we do things like feeding programs, safe houses, agricultural programs, feminine hygiene. And here's what it looks like, why I come here and why I say thank you for your generosity. Just this last year, we were able to provide more than nine million refugee meals. Nine million in one year. Those are people that get to eat every single day that are, instead of dying of malnutrition and other hunger-related diseases, now they have food and they can rebuild their lives. We were able to rescue 500 girls. Now you have to remember, that's 500 that aren't gonna be abused over and over and over again. Instead, they get counseling and a safe place to live and education and they're introduced to the hope of Jesus. We invested in more than 500 farms so that communities can be self-sustaining and move forward. We invested in uh, training more than 6,500 women in feminine hygiene. I will tell you what, when you remind when you tell, when you empower women to understand that God has made them with the Imago Dei in them, what they end up doing is they end up becoming the leaders in their community. They end up reclaiming land. They end up taking care of their kids. They quit selling their daughters and they speak truth to power. And this is the gospel. And here's what we know. In the places where we serve, the number one source of transformation for an individual or for a whole community is the presence of a local church. This last year, our partners planted more than 1,200 brand new churches one year in unreached areas. This is what we're a part of. This is, for me, this is why <laughs> kingdom builders, this is why I'm so, can I tell the number, like the vision number that you all have for here? 12 churches is incredible. Like what that means as sources of transformation, what you all are a part of both internationally and here is something that's powerful. Which then brings me back to the top of that mountain. So I'm on the, the top of the mountain. Uh, we had to wake up at 11 o'clock the night before and we hiked all through the night to get to the summit and I thought it was gonna be this magical, powerful moment I thought I, I hiked it with my wife. We were, we were climbing the mountain as part of a project to, to raise money and to care for marginalized girls who were living in a dump in Tanzania. And I thought I'd have this moment where I would capture a video on the mountain and I would share it with Saints Community Church and you would all be so inspired and so moved. But what really happened was mountain altitude sickness. And mountain altitude sickness is Sickness that happens when you get a little high up and there's less oxygen in the air and there's less, so that means less oxygen in your blood, less blood to your brain. And while I am not a medical expert, I know that there are a couple of exits in your body. And uh, when you get really sick with mountain altitude sickness, those exits are open for business. And um, 
And as I had the worst nine hours of my life getting up to the top of that mountain, I got to the top and we took the picture and my wife and I, as we descended down, I had this moment where a verse came to mind. And at the time, I didn't know that it was from this, this prophetic poet named Isaiah in Isaiah 58, 10 and 11. It says this, that if you are generous with the hungry and if you give yourself fully to the down and out, then your lives will glow in the dark and your lives will be bathed in sunlight and he'll always show you where to go. I had this moment, this thing happened inside of me that moved me and I was like, something came alive that was not yet thriving. And I can remember as we were talking with my wife, said we need to pay attention to this moment and we had a couple of conversations later and we decided that we wanted our kids to understand the kingdom of God through the eyes of the poor and the oppressed. And so we quit our job and we sold our home and we joined this crazy movement of people called Venture, this idea that we were going to try to connect with what the kingdom was saying about those who felt a little bit further out of reach. And over the years as I've looked back on that verse, there's like this if-then statement that keeps coming back to me. And it says, if you're generous, then a whole bunch of good things happen. If you're generous, your dark night becomes like the noonday. If you're generous, I'll show you where to go. In a couple of verses later, it says, if you're generous, you'll be like a well-watered garden, which goes back to God's design in the Garden of Eden, a place where everybody can thrive. And if I rolled in and and Wayne paid a lot of money to put lots of big billboards up that said, this man will show you how you can know God's will for your life. We could pack this place out, but this is exactly what Isaiah promises us. If we do this, then this will happen. If we're generous, I'll show you the way. And this is that moment where, again, we have to decide, do we know everything there is to know about generosity? Because for me, when I read that, and when it started moving inside of me, I started going, hmm, maybe generosity is a little different than I thought. Because for me, generosity was about money, and it was for rich people. And while I am super rich and bougie, uh, I don't have a lot of money, and I don't particularly have a gift of giving away a lot of money. And yet this thing, this generosity thing, says that if I'm generous, these incredible things happen. And I used to think that generosity was just for some people. But that would mean that access to some of the greatest parts of the kingdom was limited to the elite and the powerful and the wealthy. And this is the opposite of what I read of that unruly rabbi on the side of the mountain in Matthew 5 that says, who's blessed, but all of us have access to this kind of blessing. All of us, if we are generous with who we are, we can figure out what God wants to do with however many days and years and decades we have left on this planet. And so for me, I started going, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start figuring out what this thing called generosity really looks like. And if you have ever decided to start honing in and asking God to reveal something to you, he's going to do it. It's going to be like I bought my daughter, Lola, a Honda Element, 20 years old, beautiful 20-year-old vehicle. Uh, and uh, have you ever bought yourself a vehicle, new or used, and up until that point you never really noticed it, and then all of a sudden you... You buy yourself an element, and I realize, oh, I've got three elements in my neighborhood. I had no idea. This is what happens when we start going, hey, what if we all say, God, would you help me to understand what this principle of generosity looks like in my life? I promise you it'll start popping up in all the crazy places. In the songs you sing, in the songs you listen to, in the movies you watch, in the conversations you have, not just from the person on the stage here, but all over because God is a good God. His spirit is speaking to you. And I found that God wanted to reveal to me my place in this story of generosity. So one of the verses that jumped out to me right away, I would have never guessed was a generosity verse, but it's a story that many of us know, especially if you've been raised in the church in Matthew 14, it's Jesus feeding the 5,000. And if you're a kid, you like that story because the kid's kind of the hero, right? He's the one that brings his five loaves and two fishes. But in this, in this story, if we read it, we see a little bit of the kingdom plan. And in Matthew 14, 19, it says that he directed the people to sit down on the grass. So he's been talking to some folks. He's been sharing 
the good news of the kingdom, been talking about this design that maybe people have been getting wrong for a long time, and he's like, hey, let me tell you about this kingdom. And, and after the fact, they're hungry. Like maybe you'll be hungry after I get done in an hour or two. Let's go back. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and taking the, lo- the uh, five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And they ate and all were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And so there's a whole bunch, like there's a three and a five and a seven point sermon all right there. But but I just want to focus on one thing. It says that he gave thanks and then he gave the bread. And I just couldn't get that over my out of my mind, this idea of the first thing that Jesus did before he was generous was he was thankful. And so for me, I think that thankfulness precedes generosity. In fact, I think thankfulness actually turns ordinary giving into generosity because there's a a lot of reasons why we give. You can give out of emotion. You can give out of being compelled. You can give out of compassion. You can give out of obligation. You can give out of obedience. But when we give from a place of gratitude, it changes what we're doing, why we're doing it. You see, I think gratefulness gives us perspective. This morning, most of us got up and you got to open a closet and pick from multiple options of clothing. And most of us went to our kitchen and we got to pick from multiple options of food. And some of us were even lucky enough to go into a garage and pick from multiple options of vehicles. And there is nothing wrong with that. In fact, we're, most would call us very blessed for that. But did you know that this morning, 18,000 kids will die of hunger-related disease? And tomorrow, another 18, and the next day, another 18. Do you know a third of the population lives on less than $2 a day? And here's the deal, I'm not trying to make any of us feel bad. In fact, I'll bet people in this room, you've got your own set of struggles, you've got your own set of things, you, you, things aren't all working out perfectly for you, and the last thing I want to do is say, shame on you if you had some options on food, or, or even to say, oh, we should feel really bad for this group of people. Yes, I think we should, as Christ followers, be connected to the needs of other people, but the point is that perspective can allow us in our current situation to become more grateful. What does it look like for us to, to be grateful? My, my kids, I tell them all the time, and you can have whatever you want or you can ask for whatever you want, but I try to teach them three phrases, in light of, in light of, in light of what you already have and in light of what other people don't have. And it's a framework that has helped me as a parent and, and in my own life. So, so if my little kids... If my two littles, Winnie and Nia, they want another doll, it was one of their birthday yesterday, or last month and one of their birthdays this month, if they want another doll, no problem, man, that's great. You can have another doll, but how many dolls do you already have? So if you already have six dolls and you want a seventh doll, again, no problem at all. But what do other people not have in our neighborhood? We have many, many kids that wait until they get to school for their first meal and only meal of the day. And so if you want another doll, maybe you think about them and maybe, maybe instead of having a seventh doll, maybe you give away one or two dolls. You know, it's this, it's this understanding, this idea that generosity comes from understanding what we already have and what other people don't have and what God's invitation is for us to join and what he would like to do for all people. My uh, oldest daughter, Lola, we had a phone conversation when she was in middle school. Now in my house, cell phones happen in high school. But she thought she would try to push the envelope and get it in middle school. And she's like, Dad, can I, have a, can I have a cell phone? Come on, Dad, can I, this, that. And then she thought she was pulling out the great argument. Dad, all of my friends have iPhones. I was like, oh, that's easy. Hang out with poorer friends. <laughs> and while I was being a little bit sarcastic, I was being a little bit truthful. Because if we only hang out with people that are like us or more wealthy than us, people that have more than us, guess what? We get what King James says is covetousness. We we aren't satisfied. We now there's nothing wrong with thriving, but if thriving comes from a place that we're never settled, 
that we, we're not thankful, that we're not grateful. And I'm not just talking about physical things, but I'm also talking about understanding what the God of the universe has done and revealed in our own lives. If we don't understand what God is doing in us, if we're not stopping to take time to say, I'm thankful for this community of believers. I'm thankful for that food in the pantry. I will tell you what, y'all are acting like it's a, you know, a, a monumental cold front down here. When I got off the plane yesterday, it was 50 degrees warmer than where I woke up. 50 degrees warmer. I was walking around in a coat, open, and people were looking at me like, what are you doing? The point is, I literally, every morning when I take my littles to school, we pray, and one of the things I, I'm thankful for every morning is that my car started. Because if you ever gotten in your car and it doesn't start, that's a bad day, it's a frustrating day. So, up until that point happens, I'm gonna live with gratitude. And if we live with gratitude, if we see that God has been so good, that you have been blessed with a community of faith, that you have been blessed with a, um, friendships, that you have been blessed with God's good grace on your life, then all of a sudden, the world looks a little bit different. I believe that gratitude precedes generosity. And then, and then with generosity, you know, the etymology etymology, which is just the history of a word, generosity in its earliest form simply meant kind of nobility. It was given to people that were of a certain kind of, I'll just say a birth, like if you've ever watched um, Downton Abbey or uh, The Crown, you know, that it, weird, you know, they just had some creepy stuff happen in there, but, but they just thought that noble people were better. And then as we get closer to our time, uh, generosity was a little bit more about just being wealthy, so you didn't have to be noble. But think about what a good deal that is. Wealthy people got to be called generous, but they didn't even have to give away their money. Now, fast forward a little bit more to today, and generosity, we kind of understand is, hey, you have some stuff, and you give some stuff. But generosity isn't just around our wealth. Generosity is a, is a lot bigger thing. In fact, I was thinking about, as a, um, I was reading about the Macedonian church in 2 Chronicles. And in, in second, uh, second Chronicles, there's a, sorry, 2 Corinthians, there's a group of people, this Macedonian church, and they want to help some folks out, but they're poor and they're having a difficult situation. I'm going to read it word for word from the message, and here's what it says. It says, now, friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways, generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia and Providence. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and I saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could for more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of the poor Christians. Now, you have to be careful. People can abuse this really quickly and go, see, so if you're poor, you got to give more, you know, a, a prosperity type of, of, a, of a doctrine. But, but when you look at this, what, what I love about it is, here's, here's the um, earmarks of this community. They're in a deep trial and they're poor. And those are usually the people that we're supposed to feel bad for, we're supposed to do something good for. And I think, I think maybe we should, but we can also learn from. Because this... These people that were in trial and were poor, guess what? They were marked by joy and generosity. Wherever you are at, you could be marked by joy and generosity. And I have to be very careful because I don't know what you're going through. And I'm not just going to give you the, hey, bucket up in Jesus style talk. But what I am saying is the invitation of the kingdom is that there is a flow of what the spirit is doing that wherever you are at, can, you can receive and flow in joy and generosity. And I also know that this, also means that generosity is something bigger than just money because they were poor, they didn't have much. But if you read and you study the Macedonian church, their generosity was in their time, their hospitality, inviting people into their homes, sharing what they had. What does it look like for us to be generous, mom and dad? What does it look like for you to be generous with your time with your kids? Husband, what does it look like to be generous with your emotional support of your spouse? What does it look like for us to be generous in our volunteerism in this community and in the things that are represented by kingdom builders like foster care and addiction? See, generosity doesn't just have to be about money. I was talking to my wife last night and I was asking her how things were going as I 
flew in just a, a hair early to watch my team ultimately lose in football. So, you know, uh, I'm a Packer fan. You're a Saints fan. We're all just watching at this point. But um, I have enjoyed watching Jamal Williams on your team this year and before that John Kuhn and that's enough football for, for now. But I asked my wife how she was doing and she said she had finished four hours of doing one of the girls' hair. And if you know, you know, that's just part of what you do. Um, but, but that is a generosity. I think moms have a particular gift in this. It doesn't mean husbands and dads, you shouldn't be doing this, but we should watch the people that are doing it so well. What does it look like for you to be generous with your time and your emotion, with your family, with your roommate, with this family that we have here called Saints Community Church? Because when we are generous like that, things change. One of the things that I love about working with our international partners is one of Venture's values is to learn from the global church so that it's not just us raising money for them and helping them. The us-them thing has to change, and if we're not careful, we just export food or we export safety or we even export our version of the gospel, but the reality is the gospel is powerful in the places where we're serving, and they can share stuff with us like they're powerful prayers. They are powerful in their generosity, and their spirit of bravery is unmatched. And their response to the gospel, one of, I was um, talking with one of our partners, her name's Roosevelt, and Roosevelt, when she was 16, took in her first orphan. And she was caring for uh, the, the first orphan. And then by the time that she was 18, she had five orphans. And by the time she got married at 19, she had 10 orphans. And then um, when I was talking with her, uh, she came over about three months ago. And she is up to caring for 5,000 orphans and 300 widows. I read a book like that once that we should focus on those. You should check it out. Um, but one of the things that started this was Rosabelle, when she was 15 years old, before even the first child that she took in, she was reading about something that Libby and Wayne articulated so well, this thing called the tithe, which is a historic biblical teaching on the percentage of 10%. And she was like, I don't have any money to give and so she said, well, I'll tithe my time of praying. And if you're not a mathematician, that means she prayed two hours and 40 minutes every single day. All of a sudden, I'd be like, I think I'd rather give the 10% of money, right? <laughs> I mean, historically, the wealthier you get, people would rather actually give money than time because their time is Im impressive. But, but look at Roosevelt. Look at the hero. And she's been doing this for 30 years, praying two hours and 40 minutes, give or take, every single day, and now God has her caring for 5,000 orphans and 300 widows. And I'm going to stop real quick. Don't think that these stories are for somebody else in a different place. What you do today matters. She didn't, at 15, decide she was going to, oh, God gave me a vision to, to care for 5,000 widows and 300 orphans, she, or 5,000 orphans and 300 widows. She couldn't. She couldn't have had the capacity to understand that, but what she did do is she read in Scripture a Scripture that she didn't know how she was going to put it in her own context, and the Holy Spirit helped her to understand, oh, you can tithe your time. I know this because Venture started with three college students that heard a missionary on a stage and decided to go on a bike ride across the country, and what happened with that thing, they never planned on it being a movement or an organization, but has now yielded close to $70 million in missions and justice work around the world. So this morning at this time in this season as we're in the middle of this fast, please know that when the invitation to be a part of generosity is an invitation whether you are a seasoned Christ follower or not to go, what does generosity look like in my life? We have another uh, partner in another part of the world where people are literally being killed to share the gospel in it's becoming so difficult for us to get food into these places and, and for these people to, to deliver food to AIDS communities, leper colonies, yes, those still exist, to orphans and to refugee camps that we, once we lost our third person that was killed for sharing food and sharing a meal, we thought about suspending our feeding program last year. And so we talked with our 
global partners and we said, hey, we're considering suspending the program because we are concerned for your safety. And one of our partners, her name's Cuckoo, sent me an email. And it kind of slapped me upside the head. Cuckoo said, I won't run away from Yangon. I'll never leave my people in trouble for the safety of me and my family, no matter how difficult it is. I'll always be in Yangon for my people. It's my calling from God. It's my commitment to help my people as much as I can. Shouldn't we help more when people are in trouble? Sure sounds like the Macedonian church. And if we're, if we're not careful, we're just going to go, oh, Cuckoo and Rosabelle are other. They are not other. They are like you and me who read Scripture and see what Scripture has to do with the poor and the oppressed around the world or right in their community, and they do something about it. You were created to live with this kind of generosity and bravery, with this kind of courage, with this kind of uh, kingdom view that says, yeah, I see what I have and I'm grateful for it and how can I use this for the rest of the world? And then when that happens, when we step into that, all of a sudden, God's design becomes more beautiful than ever. Now, I'm not here to give you a theological treatise on tithing, okay? I'll leave that to the good pastor, Reverend Dr. Wayne Northup. But we do see biblical and historic precedents around this 10%. And I was reading a book by Rich Stearns. The book's called Holding the Gospel. It's a great book. And he said, the American church is pretty generous. Gives about 2.58% of their income, which you might go, oh, that's quite a bit lower than 10%, but it's like 20 times what a non-churched person gives. But then he said, what happens if we give the other 7.5%? 5%, which would be about 180, 168 billion. Well, here's what happens. Just, just to get to the tithe, we eliminate all poverty, we, elimi- we give primary education, we give primary uh, health care nutrition. This is for the entire world. We have enough money to pay off every church building. Someone say amen, all 12 of them. And then we get to go again the next year. So here's what I'm saying, the invitation around generosity is not for you to have so much less. It's for us to participate in something so beautiful. You see, I think gratefulness precedes generosity and generosity is far different than we think. And that generosity then turns into good. Here's what I mean by good. I'm not talking about a sweatshirt that you wear from Cotopaxi that says do good. Cotopaxi is an outdoor apparel company who doesn't want to wear an alpaca on their sweatshirt or or, uh, backpack, but do good. This good that we're talking about is the word tov. And tov we see all the way back in the beginning narrative of the beginning of the earth when God is an artist and an architect and a designer. And he makes this kingdom, he forms it in a way where everybody can thrive. And at the end of every day, he says it's good, it's tov creating a system for all of us. And then a couple of pages later in the Hebrew text, Tov is broken. Broken relationships, broken families, and broken communities. But from that point on, the rest of the story all the way to Revelation is a good God that is reconciling and restoring Tov. That is bringing good back to broken places. And that God is inviting us to be a part of it. This reconciling restoration, while he is working in us, he's also inviting us to be a part of his good work around the world. And let me tell you, when you see Tov, you can't unsee it. Let me just end with one story. Hannah, this is what Tov looks like when you give to kingdom builders. My parents and village people work in the gravel pit. During rainy season, work is not possible since the shores are flooded. Many people go hungry from the little they earn from selling sand. Therefore, people are compelled to sell their bodies. In Nepal, there is a caste system. Brahman is the highest caste. And Badi are a part of the Dalit, which is the lowest, the untouchable caste. When I was small, 
Our friend and her husband live near our house, and they would often come to visit. The husband told my sister that he wanted to take her to visit our mother's birthplace in Ramgat. Instead, he took her in a tractor, where he drugged her to make her unconscious. He sold her for $30. I started losing consciousness from the shock of losing my sister. So my father took me to the hospital in Nepal Gunj. When the doctor checked the x-ray, he read the report that I was Badi. He then tried to rape me. Later, I told my father that my doctor tried to rape me. My father said, if we say something to anyone, they will not treat us. To whom shall we complain? When I met Hannah, her ace was a crucial ace to be sold out in Delhi. And she has also had great fear that somebody will destroy her life. So it took long time for me to establish relationship. And then I began to build relationship with Hannah, her father. I began to share my heart to them that in order to protect them, we would start hostel or home in Kathmandu and uh, give them education. And when I shared this, they, they got excited. When I went to the hostel, the behavior of the people there changed me. After going there, I learned what real love looks like. And the thing that changed me most has been getting to know Jesus. In seven years of time, out of 700 people, 400 people have come to know the Lord. And today, by the power of the gospel, the village is changing. And the former trafficker who sold Hannah's sister is the pastor of that church. I'm very thankful to the Lord for venture because partnership is helping us to fulfill our daily needs in the hostel, in the schools, everywhere. And together we are going to stop human trafficking in Badi people. That's what I want to be a part of. To me, that is Tov. That is the restoration of broken things. That happens in partnership with generosity that starts with gratitude. There is a, a moment in that, in that video where the dad says, to whom shall we complain? To a group of people in New Orleans at Saints Community Church. That's who. I mean, that's the invitation. The invitation for us is to be thankful for where we're at and to participate in the things that God's already doing. There's so many things in that video that's hard to unpack. The, the trafficker that becomes the pastor is far too long to explain, except that it's very complicated in those areas. The gospel is powerful for the oppressed and the oppressor, and the gospel does also demand justice, and there is place for both of those. But here's what Hannah has told me to share every single time is, 
that trafficker became a Christ follower because Hannah read in scripture that you're supposed to forgive and she got on a bus and she went back to the village and forgave her neighbor. And her neighbor was so overwhelmed that he broke down. He became a Christ follower. He went to Bible college. He became a pastor and since then has gone and rescued almost every single girl that he's ever trafficked before. There's still a part of me that wants to lock him up, but that is between him and God and, and, and that community. But here's what I know. I want to be a part of God's kingdom come. Here's what I know. I, this is what I want to be a part of. As we head into a new political season, you could be known for what you put on Facebook about the things that you care about in our government, and that's okay. But don't we want to be known for a place that's grateful? and generous and good? Don't we want to introduce, if you, if you look at those stats of what the global church can do, we can be the source and the solution for every problem that we have from education to healthcare, from addiction. We can bring restoration and tow back to broken places. Gratefulness, generosity, and good. Full disclosure, that, that video's gosh, eight, nine years old now. And I keep sharing it because I get to do a little Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. Can I very quickly tell you the rest of the story about Hannah? Because I was hanging out with her earlier this year when she flew back over here. So, so Hannah, Hannah is like the first in her people group to do almost everything. It's documented. I'm not lying to you. You see that and you go, oh, that's a nice story that a, a nonprofit or a ministry or missions put together. But I'm telling you what, she is a walking miracle. She, she came over to the U.S. about five, six years ago and people were so amazed. You could just tell the anointing, similar to when I hear you talk, Libby. You could tell this anointing on her and people were so moved that she got not one but two full ride scholarships to uh, universities right here in the United States. She had two books written about her. She was highlighted in a national news source. Uh, she had a lawyer that often to get, offered to give her full citizenship, would do all of the paperwork for that. And then she, she landed in Florida at one of our board members' multi-million dollar home. She was living the restoration redemptive story and it was beautiful. And then a global health crisis hit. And God started working on her heart for her sisters in Nepal. So she literally gave up the schooling and the million dollar home. She went back to Nepal and she rented a 400 square foot apartment where she let 10 other women live with her. I live with five women. Never mind. She said, God, what do you want me to do? How do, I, how do I address the problems that I see in front of me? And so she started her own movement, her own organization called Himalayan Entrepreneurial Resources, which if anybody can spell that, well done. Uh, it was about women empowerment and anti-trafficking and church planting. And so far, she's trained over 65,000 women in feminine hygiene. So far this year, she with her own hands has rescued 53 women herself, like flown to Nepal and gotten physical altercations and pulled girls out. Most recently she was in India and she was sharing with some women about the hope of the gospel. Women who were born and raised in brothels, that's all they know. They literally are born there, they watch it, they normalize it and that's what they do. And they ended up becoming Christ followers. Now, she didn't have the authority to pull them all out, but guess what? She went back this month and started a church in the brothel. She was recently in a prison, invited by the government, government that doesn't even acknowledge that her people exist and said, I see what you're doing. Will you go to the prison? Went to the prison, 25 girls became Christ followers. There's a church there. She said, I may not be able to pull everybody out, but I can bring the gospel in. I will tell you what... This gospel movement that we are partnering with is happening with or without us. And we get to be a part. The invitation is that we get to be a part right here in New Orleans. What God wants to do right here in New Orleans, not only through these two campuses, but through 12 campuses. Not only through what we do in these walls, but through foster care and through addiction. The gospel is good news. It's tov. And the invitation for us is to join in with it through gratitude generosity and ultimately being a part of doing good.
So as Pastor Wayne comes up, I'm going to encourage you. You might be like, man, I, I don't know if I'm going to go to India and rescue a girl, or I don't know that I'm going to start a nonprofit, but maybe we start the exact same place where Jesus started this week, and that is to simply give thanks. As you go and, and you have a meal, maybe it's only a Daniel fast meal, or maybe it's something else, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and just model it. I'm going to pray over your meal. So you don't even have to, man, you, you've done all your spiritual things for the day. But what if we just took this week and we were intentional about what we were grateful for? When you turn that car engine over and it works, when you get up and your heater works, on Wednesday when you all have 70 degrees and I've got minus one degree. You know, whatever it is that you're going to feel thankful for. And then if we start asking the Spirit to continue to teach us about generosity, whether you're a pastor on a campus, whether you've been part of this church for a long time or first time, to be a part of what's generous so that we can be a part of something that restores Tov. God of the universe, we thank you for our meal that we're about to partake of. We thank you that you provided us food and we think of the 18,000 children who won't make it today and we think of the third of the population that's living on less than $2 and then we think of your good, good design and, and we start by being thankful for the meal that we're about to partake in. And then we ask that out of gratitude you would create space inside of us to develop a a more beautiful relationship with generosity. And then I pray that this, this house and these leaders would lead us towards good. I pray that your family and your home would be marked by good, by tov. The places that are broken, that, that's hard for other people to, to know about, that tov would saturate, that the oil of his spirit would just fall over your home. And I pray for your homes and your jobs. I pray for your campuses and I pray for your marriages that, that you would know that gratitude, generosity, and good is available, not just connected to your wallet, but connected to your life for his kingdom come and his will be done.